Amorphophallus titanum. It's not a name that rolls easily off the tongue, but for those in the horticultural know, it's a plant unlike any other. Its blossoms are extremely rare. In fact, there were only about 10 blooms in the U.S. in the 20th century. When one bloomed at the Huntington Gardens in San Marino, California, in 1999, it created international headlines and drew crowds in excess of 76,000. When it unexpectedly blossomed again in 2002, there was even greater buzz, a media frenzy. This flower is a celebrity among plants. With further blossoms in 2009, 2010, and 2014, there were even greater crowds and more admirers of this titan among flowers. What makes this bloom so special? Partly it's the sheer size of this largest compound flower in the world. One bloom was nine and a half feet tall, and it can open to a diameter of up to four feet. At the very bottom of the blossom is a deep burgundy color, the color of meat. The flower also generates heat that is approximately human body temperature. The size of the flower isn't the only thing that's spectacular, however. The fragrance of the flower has been compared to that of rotten meat. Another name for this plant is corpse flower. The combination of odor, color, and heat effectively imitates a decomposing mammal. That smell is like perfume to carcass-eating insects, like flies that come to investigate and in the process pollinate the plant. The smell draws insects from as far away as two miles. Flowers whose odor draws international crowds have something in common with our readings from Hosea and 2 Corinthians. Let's follow our nose. Scientists will tell us that the key to memory isn't what our eyes see, nor is it what our tongues taste. It isn't what our ears hear or fingers touch. The key to memory is actually what our noses smell. I want us to think back with our nose and take a trip down memory lane. I want us to imagine we're in our grandparents' house when we were a child. For some of us, that may be only a few days back. For others, maybe a bit longer. Do we smell a particular food our grandmother cooked? Or maybe a perfume she wore? Perhaps a hint of mothballs on her sweater. How about our grandfather? Perhaps pipe tobacco or Old Spice? <laughs> What is our nose remembering? Sense are powerful triggers of memories, aren't they? If we imagine those scents today without even actually smelling them, we travel backwards in time and are transported 
to another place. Suddenly, we're children again, made young through the aromas of our youth. As mammals, our sense of smell isn't the greatest. Bloodhounds have noses that are a hundred million times more sensitive than ours. Yet even so, researchers discovered a few years back that our sense of smell is greater than they had expected. College students were blindfolded, gloved, and had ears plugged and asked to crawl through grassy fields using only their noses to follow a twisting, chocolate-scented, 30-foot-long path of twine. Two-thirds of them were able to smell their way through, and researchers discovered that we smell in stereo. If one nostril was plugged, nobody could follow the trail. Our sense of smell is important not only for memory, but also for helping us navigate through the world. Our olfactory capacity is a key input for our lives. Given its importance, we're not surprised to discover smelly stories in Scripture. We're going to follow a scent trail through the Bible, stopping at each olfactory story. We'll breathe in the smell and remember. One of the earliest occurs after the flood has subsided. And Noah builds an altar for burnt offerings of different animals. And we're told, when the Lord smelled the pleasing odor, he promised to never again flood the earth. Evidently, God likes the smell of barbecue. We find another smelly story later in Genesis with Jacob stealing Esau's blessing. Jacob, armed with food like his brother Esau would prepare, wearing goat's hair gloves on his hands and his brother Esau's garments, ask for his father's blessing, pretending to be Esau. His blind father, Isaac, says, The voice is Jacob's, but the hands are Esau's. Jacob comes nearer, and his father smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him, saying, The smell of my son is like the smell of a field. The Lord has blessed. It wasn't the taste of the food that fooled him, nor the feel of the goat skins. It certainly wasn't the voice that convinced him. It was the smell of Esau's garments that Jacob was wearing that finally tricked Isaac. The scent trail leads us to a cart carrying the embalmed bodies of Jacob and his son Joseph out of Egypt. There's a smell of incense because Egyptians believed incense, the dried sap of trees, had divine properties. By wrapping embalmed bodies in it, dead flesh would be transformed and given eternal life. Go a little further 
to the tent of meeting, where Aaron, Moses' brother, is burning incense in the morning and evening upon charcoal before the presence of the Lord. Sniff a little further, and we'll see a plague in the camp of the Israelites, and Aaron burning incense and creating a wall of it, separating the living from the dead. The powerful incense acts as a barrier for the plague and stops it in its tracks. That same cloud of incense protects the high priest on the Day of Atonement when he approaches the Lord and offers prayers of forgiveness for the people. Follow the scent trail a little further to Bethlehem, where Naomi advises Ruth to anoint herself with fragrant oils before meeting Boaz on the threshing floor. Ruth perfumed herself so that Boaz might find her attractive. In Psalm 45, a royal wedding psalm, the wedding robe of the king is fragrant with myrrh, aloes, and cassia. In the Song of Songs, incense and Perfume is a metaphor for the beauty of the beloved. Human love is elevated into the divine sphere. Follow your nose to Gilead, where an aromatic balm is found that cures diseases and heals wounds. Incense forms a bridge from Hebrew scriptures to New Testament. Zechariah is at the temple in Jerusalem at the time of the burning of the incense and an angel of the Lord appears and tells him to name his son John. Follow your nose as wise men from the east bring gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh to the infant Jesus. Follow that trail all the way to Bethany where the stench of a corpse belonging to Lazarus is changed into the fragrance of life. Mary, sister of Lazarus, takes a pound of pure nard and anoints Jesus, and the fragrance fills the entire room. When she was criticized, Jesus said, leave her alone. She has anointed my body for burial. Anointed. It's a term redolent with aromas of spice and fragrance and significance because the very title by which we refer to Jesus, the Christ or the Messiah, means anointed one. Jesus has the very aroma of God upon him. Fragrant with the very fullness of God's life. And yet, he dies on a cross. Follow your nose to a tomb in the garden where Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus have wrapped his corpse with a hundred pounds of myrrh and aloes and spices. They hope to cover the stench of death with the fragrance of life, to mask the decomposition that will quickly set in Follow your nose to Easter morning, where Mary is clinging to his feet. I believe it was more than his tangible presence, that it was more than hearing him call her name that convinced her that he was alive. It was the fragrance of one who had risen from death to life, that she caught a whiff of myrrh and aloes and spices that day 
when those two disciples were walking along the road to Emmaus and he was hidden from their eyes. I believe it was more than the breaking of the bread that convinced them. It was the scent of a Savior with spices and fragrances. And when he stood on the seashore and asked them, Children, have you any fish? A sea breeze carried his fragrance on the wind all the way to the boat. And they knew it was him, the anointed one who had been fragrant during his life, had come back aromatically enhanced in his resurrection life. We follow that scent trail all the way to the book of Revelation, where we're told the prayers of the saints rise like incense before the throne of God and the Lamb. There is a scent trail from Genesis all the way to Revelation. There are smelly stories throughout Scripture. Now we're ready to do a little nosing around flowers. Flowers mark significant milestones throughout our lives, don't they? When a child is born, what is sent with the baby's breath in the arrangement? Flowers, roses, some kind of floral arrangement. Preschoolers, when they graduate, celebrate their achievement not only with a diploma, but bring their parents a single carnation. Show choirs, vocal ensembles, and dance performances of children are showered with flowers afterwards. Later on, there are boutonnieres and corsages at high school proms, a dozen red roses for our beloved. A bouquet tossed by a bridesmaid. And at the end of life, a floral spray on top of the casket. Flowers mark significant milestones in our lives. If we asked a botanist, what flowers are for, they would say they're specialized leaves on modified stems whose role is to help the plant reproduce. They're the precursor stage to seeds, and the way they accomplish their reproductive role is to be attractive to pollinators. They do so in a number of ways. They do it visually with striking colors that are attractive to the eye and a beautiful symmetry. They do it by taste, proffering a bit of nectar, sweet sugar, for any number of creatures such as bees, butterflies, beetles, hummingbirds, moths, bats, flies, and many others. That nectar is situated such that the pollinator has to brush up against the pollen, which is then transferred to the next flower and pollinating it, leading to future seeds. Flowers accomplish their role by scent because within that nectar are aromatic compounds that broadcast a heady fragrance to any passing pollinator. Flowers are designed by nature to be attractive by sight, taste, and smell. Which brings us to our reading from Hosea that speaks of such flowers and in which God compares himself to an evergreen cypress of Lebanon. The cedars of Lebanon were considered to be trees of life because they were ever green. 
to walk among the cedars of Lebanon and inhale that fresh cedar scent of life is intoxicating because of how the mountains of Lebanon are situated with the seacoast the marine layer rolls in and deposits dew on the hills making them verdant and fragrant lush with life in the middle of the desert is this vital oasis with evergreens on that tree of life are blossoms that are attractive by sight taste and smell those blossoms are a sign of the new age did we hear blossom like the lily flourish with beauty blossom like the vine and fragrance like the wine of Lebanon the blossoms on this tree are to be heady with the fragrance of evergreen eternal life which brings us to our reading from 2nd Corinthians to an amazing passage where Paul says that Christ leads us in triumphal procession Christ who has conquered sin and death whose robes of victory are redolent with the resurrection infused with fragrance saturated with spices we are following him and those aromas are soaking in to our clothes too Paul says that it's through us that he spreads in every place the fragrance that comes from knowing him because we have come into his house because we've been baptized in his death because we've been raised in his resurrection because we've been anointed with his spirit because we fed on his body because we've drunk of his blood because we've heard his words we've taken on his fragrance because he has covered us in his righteousness he has clothed us in his robes we've taken on the fragrance that comes from knowing him for we are the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved the fragrance of from life to life we are blossoms on the tree of life called to spread in every place the fragrance that comes from knowing him in every place from when children are born to when they graduate from preschool in every place at dance performances and show choirs and vocal ensembles in every place when they go to high school proms and get married in every place when they send roses to their beloved and grieve the death of loved ones in every place where we work where we live where we play in every place we are to spread the fragrance of Christ we are to be attractive to every kind of person bees butterflies bats beetles hummingbirds moths and more we are to call to memory what many may have forgotten especially some folks in Charlottesville that we're all formed by the hands of God and all have the scent of the flowers of paradise upon us we originate in the garden and our destiny will be found there too we are blossoms to help the world remember the powerful scent memory of our origin with God we are to be so attractive that we invite a second look to offer the nectar of life freely to brush up against others with the sticky pollen of God's love to exude the fragrance of resurrection life 
when we do so, we fulfill our purpose to lead others along the scent trail back to God. We blossoms are a sign of God's new age in this world to smell to high heaven and to lead the world from death to the throne of God and the Lamb. We are to wrap the incense of life around others so that perishable flesh might put on imperishability, so that mortality might put on immortality. Our lives are to be a fragrant offering and pleasing odor to the Lord. Human love is lifted to the divine sphere. The scent of a Savior is like a wall of incense separating the living from the dead. It's like a balm of Gilead pouring out healing upon the world. Let me ask you this. If a single blossom on a corpse flower that's immobile, stuck in a pot, can spread the fragrance from death to death in a two-mile circumference, how much farther? Can we who are blossoms on the tree of life who move throughout the world spread the fragrance from life to life in every place? If a flower of death can draw crowds of 76,000, just think how many the flower of life can attract. We are the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved. We have the aroma of the Almighty, the scent of the Savior, the fragrance of forgiveness. Let us go forth as blossoms, spreading in every place the fragrance that comes from knowing Him. Thanks be to God. Amen. If you're ready to follow the anointed one and spread the fragrance that comes from knowing him, we'd welcome you forward as we sing, Here is Bread. Please stand as you're able.